Well, hello and welcome to today's episode of The Visible Workplace. My name is Dr. Tom Rowley and it's been an interesting day here. What happened? Well, I had a power outage. It was a scheduled power outage, but they kicked off at 8.30 a.m. And this meant that my family was still at home doing the final preps, getting ready for school. And as we were probably five minutes away from leaving, power went off. Because we live on property, the water also stops. No power, no water. And this was a minor problem, no big deal. Other than one of my children was brushing their teeth at the time left the tap on, but without the pump, no water. And so this was all fine until the power cap back on, the pump kicked in and suddenly got an open tap, just, just dumping water. And unfortunately, to make it a little bit worse, he'd actually left the, uh, the plug pressed in. So there was no safety on the sink water's pouring in and luckily it went down the drain pipe. There was a good tiler. We had an excellent tiler who did the work on our property and it meant that even though for 45 minutes, the water was going out of the sink into the drawer a little bit, which I tied it up, vast majority of it went down into the sink, into the, into the drain hole. So this has been an adventurous day. Power didn't come back on until 4 p.m. It's been a long day and it's fascinating to have a day like this because the internet was not working. In where I live, we're reliant on Starlink and uh, 4G just didn't cut it. Suddenly it's a day without computers. And so it's been a very, very interesting day to, uh, to be part of these adventures. But we are going to leave the problems of living on a rural property for the moment and come back to our topic du jour, which we're going to have a look at bottlenecks. And bottlenecks are a fascinating part of work and of life. I first came across them when I was playing tennis. And tennis may not sound like a very bottleneck place. It's like, well, what do you do? You, you serve and then you hit the ball and you hit the ball and someone makes a mistake or hits a winner. What are you talking about? Well, what happened was I'd been discussing the idea, the concept of the magic board uh, with a friend of mine who's a software developer. And this was probably 2022, so maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, early stage, just is this concept even gonna work? Hadn't really defined it that well. And he said, oh, oh, you need to read a book. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, there's this book called The Goal. You should definitely read it. I'm like, okay, okay. I, I didn't know what this book was about, but this book is about a factory and the factory has a problem. They're running behind in their production that they're, their uh, assembly lines that put together the widgets for the factory keep breaking down and keep having problems. And this is a discussion about what seems like assembly lines, but really it's about one thing, which is bottlenecks. And the insight that comes from the goal, which was written in 1984, was that the assembly line can only work at the pace of the limiting or the, the of the rate limiting machine i.e what's the rate limiting machine it's the one that goes the slowest the one that goes the slowest so let's take an example let's say there's five aspects to an assembly line five different machines there's no people involved and the first one does 500 units per hour and the second one does 100 units per hour and the third one does 250 units per hour and the fourth one does 40 units per hour and the last one does 300 units per hour. And the question is, well, what will happen to this assembly line? And the first thing that you might consider is that, well, it depends. And this is very true. Let's say in our first scenario that we are just feeding in 20 into this series of machines. And what will happen? Well, all of the machines can handle that 20. And so they'll go through, you put 20 in the beginning and 20 will come out at the end. Next hour, 20 in the beginning and 20 out at the end. So the production line is running smoothly. 
But then let's imagine there's some more demand. There's some more requirement for more. And so they start putting through 40 units per hour. And the first machine can do 500, not a problem. The second machine can do 100, not a problem. The third machine does 250, not a problem. The fourth machine does 40. It's at capacity, but it can still cope. It's fine. And then the last one does 300. It's fine. And so we put in 40 and out comes 40. But hopefully you can see what happens after this. Let's say that there is now more demand and they're like, make it make more. I want a hundred per hour. And so the gentleman at the beginning starts feeding in a hundred and the first machine's fine. It does 500, no worries at all. Second machine is fine, 250. Third machine, let me get this right. I think I've messed up my machines anyway. Third machine is fine. It can do 250. The second machine does 100, it's fine, it's at capacity, but the fourth machine, it can only do 40. And so what's going to happen? Well, it's going to produce 40, that's its limits. It will produce 40 and the 40 that go through will be handled by that final machine that does 300, no worries at all, and out will come 40. Even though 100 went in at the beginning of the hour, 40 came out. And what's happened to those other 60? Well, they are backlogged. And they're backlogged specifically right before that slowest machine. And now we have a bottleneck. And this is what the goal is about. Identifying the bottlenecks in the production system. And interestingly enough, it's very easy to be blind to this. The whole book is written as a, almost a mystery. They have no idea what's going on. They don't know what to fix. And this is by far the default. Just reread or just write, didn't reread it. I read a, another version of this book written by a different author who had studied the goal and studied Eli Goldratt's uh, insights extensively. And this book was called The Bottleneck Rules. The Bottleneck Rules. And it was a play on words. It basically said, hey, here are the rules about bottlenecks, but also the bottleneck rules production. That the 40, the slowest one, is as much as it can produce. And so unless we can make that machine make more and take it to 50, or take it to 100 or get two more machines and now we've got 120 and now the slowest one will be the 100. But without any of those changes, the bottleneck rules production. You will not get more than the slowest aspect of the, as part of the system, of the assembly line. And this is also true in chemistry. For those of you who maybe took uh, chemistry at school or took chemistry at university, then you may well have come across this idea of the rate limiting step, that there is a one reaction in a series of reaction that is the slowest. And that slowest reaction is what defines the speed of the overall reaction. Exactly the same idea. And if we can find a catalyst which speeds up that slowest step, then the entire production increases. You start to get into industrial production of chemicals and that sort of stuff. But this idea of the bottleneck is critical. And you might think, well, wh why is this even a problem? Well, what we are facing in most workplaces is that we have moved to the knowledge economy. Our work is commonly in computers. It's not so visible anymore. The work's not visible and the bottlenecks are not visible. In this new book, the, the Bottleneck Rules gave an example of an accounting system. And they went through and looked where the backlog was and it was right before the senior account management. And what that senior account management wanted had to do was review what had gone on and say, yes, I approve this. But here's the catch. The senior account manager 
could only do, let's say 40 per day, but were they doing that? No, they weren't even doing that. They were doing 10 per day. Their total capacity was 40. They were the bottleneck and yet they weren't even at capacity for that bottleneck. They were only doing 10. It's like having a machine that could do 40, but running it at quarter speed. And this, this was because they were not aware that they were the bottleneck and their time was commonly spent sorting out the problems that came from the bottleneck. And this was a fascinating setup because they're the senior account manager. They're the ones that have to sign off on the accounts. But when the accounts were slow to be signed off, there were all these problems that guess who because whose problems they were? Well, it was the senior account manager's problems. And so 30 out of her 40 capacity was spent sorting out problems that was because she was the bottleneck. And this might sound so obvious when we're discussing it, but this was certainly not obvious and it was pretty easy to miss because those fires traditionally come with emotions and they come with emotions of anger and emotions of like, make this change now, make this happen now. And they were not aware that they were the bottleneck. And once they became aware that they were the bottleneck and they spent the vast majority of their time acting at capacity, do you know what happened? The problems downstream of the bottleneck went away. There were no more angry people chasing payment because they got paid on time. And this is happening all over the place. This is happening very, very commonly because it's not easy to see these bottlenecks. And if we don't see them, then we can't do anything about them. They could be running at quarter speed. They could be running at half speed. But if we can recognize the bottleneck and say, oh, look, that is the rate limiting step. We're getting 40 through. This machine operates at 40 as an analogy. Then we can say, okay, well, we need to work at that step. Or we look at that machine that's producing 40 and it's only running at 10. It's like, well, let's turn it up to full speed first of all. And that will quadruple production from 10 to 40 with no other changes. And this bottleneck rules book is very fascinating because it goes in and, and it's not necessarily saying just buy another machine and double capacity. It's like, no, 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 you, there might be other ways. There might be the machine that's running at half speed. There might be a gap beforehand. There might be all sorts of things going on that are causing the bottleneck. But within our context of work, most people's modern work, the real problem is not the bottleneck, it's the fact that we can't see it. And so this lack of visibility around the work, because people either don't have any way of tracking their work, or work is managed verbally, or work is managed in people's heads, or work is managed in multiple different ways, where only one person can tell what's going on, then all of these problems mean that we can't see. We can't see the work and we can't see the bottlenecks. And it might be procedural. Hey, there's no documentation of what we're meant to do. Or it might be people. Hey, you are the leader of the business and you're split 17 ways and you are the bottleneck on all of this work that needs to be done. I'm finding this myself. I'm like, hang on, what, what am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? And that's a great question. Anyone higher up or leadership roles, it's like, hey, what am I doing that I shouldn't be? What am I holding on to that I shouldn't be? What should I be delegating? Where am I the bottleneck in the system? These are great questions to ask. But it really helps if you can see where the work is getting stuck. Capacity doesn't necessarily equal productivity if we've got problems with bottlenecks. So what's our possibility here? Well, 
we can see the bottleneck if we can see the work. And so having a look at dates of when things get done, how long it takes to execute, having a look at a workflow that's stuck, it's got a red symbol next to it. Oh, I think we've got a problem here. The machine broke and that machine will not fix itself until it gets fixed. The production in that line has totally shut down. That's an extreme case of a bottleneck where production of one machine, we'll continue with this machine analogy, drops to zero because the machine broke. Guess what the output is? Zero. And guess what the problems and the consequences of that? Delays, angry customers, lost business, poor reviews. And the question is how long until you realize that the machine is broken or its analogy with your business that the file got lost or somebody didn't show up to work and they're the only ones who know how to do something. And then you find out about it because of the fire instead of being able to see it in your project management. Backlogs generate this idea of increasing demand, eventually revealing bottlenecks that were not clear is critical. Let's say for instance, that your maximum fulfillment is five people per week and you've been selling three per week and everything's great. And then you sell five per week and word gets out that you're doing great work, but you don't know that you are at five per week in fulfillment capacity and now you sell eight per week. Now you've got a problem. The five is the max. And now we've got three clients not getting served. And then you sell another eight the next week. And now we've, do we drop down the first three that were in the first week and they went in the second week and now we're at two and we've got a backlog of six. And then the next week we get through the five that were meant to be done in week two, but we've got another eight. Now we're at nine backlogged and this will continue to get worse and worse. And because of the delays that don't seem very significant in the beginning, oh, only three people didn't get served this week, we'll fix them next week, failing to realize that another eight are coming. And this is when we end up in these cycles of selling and doing and selling and doing because we can't see what's going on quick enough and dealing with the problems of an unrealized bottleneck takes a lot more work than actually just sorting out the bottleneck. Just like the senior accountant who started signing 40 per day and all of the problems went away because she stopped being the bottleneck, which she was, but she was acting at capacity and all of the problems went away. I'm gonna leave you with one more idea. There's a lot of, a lot of excitement around AI. But I'd have you consider whether AI is the bottleneck. And if it is, and if, it, if the work that it is doing is the bottleneck, then this is fantastic. What we should see is a lot more production of a lot more things. And this may well happen. The ability for AI to not only write the content and edit the content and post the content, without our intervention at all, well, we should see a vast amount of content. Now, whether that serves humanity is another question, but nonetheless, the ability for it to do everything from click the button and off it goes, this, this may be very, very powerful. Or it might be that humans are still involved and the bottleneck was not the AI and all we got was a machine that can do a thousand per hour but downstream of that is a machine that does 40 and now we have a massive backlog of AI generated content, AI generated images, AI generated stuff that still needs to be curated. And maybe, maybe it won't. Maybe we'll just spam everything with content that's pretty good by the AI. I don't know how this is gonna play out, but if the AI is not the bottleneck, then we won't get the results that we're expecting. And perhaps bringing AI to the bottlenecks will be the actual answer. It's like, oh, 
hang on, it's not the copy production. We've got a bottleneck in posting or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. The bottleneck is somewhere else, approval. And we bring AI to that and suddenly it moves. So we'll see how it plays out. But that is the question mark. Is AI solving problems that are the bottleneck or, or is it just making a whole lot cheaper to get stuff done but the bottlenecks in production are still elsewhere. So we'll find out. But I think this discussion around bottlenecks is fascinating and it comes down to one thing, the ability to see the work. If you want some help with this, then head over to magicboards.io, which allow you to see the work of your business. And uh, you can check out that software and how it makes work visible. Thank you so much for joining me uh, in this podcast, The Visible Workplace. Next week, we've got a special guest. And so tune in for that one. If you are enjoying and you're not already liked and subscribed, then go ahead and do that. And if you do know anyone that is struggling with backend operations of their business, working too many hours, too many fires, too successful causing a giant train wreck in their life, then let them know about Visible Workplace Podcast and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode next week. See you then. Thanks for joining us at the Visual Workplace. This is a notification that the information and ideas discussed here are general in nature and do not take into account your specific circumstances. You should seek specialist advice for any medical, financial, emotional, mental, or other difficulties that you are facing with appropriate specialists and professionals so that they can apply your specific circumstances and give you the required advice. Thank you for joining us. But this is also a notification that all information is indeed general in nature and not specific for your personal circumstances.